Welcome back to module two. We're right at the end of the module and we're going to finish up by talking about the history of the solar system. And we'll start by talking about how we get the ages of objects in the solar system. Now, if we were interested in getting the surface age of something like uh, the Mercury or our moon, we can really easily do that by counting the number of craters on the surface. Now, I want to make sure we understand what craters really are. So I'm sure we have a sense that something hits the surface and then there's a hole in the ground. But what's actually potentially surprising to you is that the majority of the hole itself comes from all of the energy that that impactor had because it was moving so fast that it vaporizes a ton of rock of the original surface that it landed on. And the crater is much bigger across than we would initially expect for the object that's hitting it. When we look at the craters on a place like the moon, we see that there's a variety of sizes. Some of the times they overlap each other. Some of the really big craters, like the one shown here, have kind of this bubbling up in the middle. Uh, and that's because the uh, impact was so intense that it melted a little bit of the surface and that kind of is a splash up of sorts. Uh, we don't see that in every crater, but just the biggest ones that can kind of puncture through that top layer surface. And the moon is covered in impact craters, especially the far side, the side that we can't see from our view on Earth. And I want you to take a moment to think about the open question here on this slide. So what planets out of the ones that we've mentioned in our overview of the solar system would this process work for uh, and why? And what are reasons that uh, some of the other planets, this idea of counting craters wouldn't work at all? So pause the video to think for a little bit. All right, so hopefully you thought about the fact that the outer four planets that we talked about have a lot of ices, they have a lot of hydrogen and helium gases, and so there's not a surface that is rocky and solid like we see for the inner planets. But what might surprise you is that this doesn't work very well on Earth, and the reason for that is because our surface is constantly renewed. So if we were to count craters, and there are a few on Earth that we can still go and visit, if we were to count craters, we're not getting an accurate age of the planet, but only of the surface, which is a fairly young surface because of this recycling. Now, plate tectonics is something that uh, is often covered in middle school or high school earth science, and I want to make sure that we all feel comfortable with the topic before we move on. It's the motion of big plates of crust, the uppermost layer of the earth, moving around in different ways that can cause rift zones in the middle of the ocean. Uh, when we have a continental plate and an oceanic plate, there's a subduction zone where uh, we get this renewal process. And we get things like um, Mount Everest and the Himalayas when two uh, continental plates crash into each other. Earth's surface is constantly being changed and recycled, uh, and so we can't count craters as an accurate measurement of their age. Plate tectonics is an interesting topic. It's not uh, directly relevant to our curriculum goals, but if you're interested in something like this, uh, I'm happy to talk about it more in student support hours, or you can uh, consider taking geology classes that we have at GRCC as well. Now, when we do want to talk about some of the evidence we have for past cratering. So even if we can't estimate the age of the whole planet, we can learn a little bit about our interactions with the wider solar system. So on the left here, we have a photograph that was taken um, of a site that actually isn't a true crater. Instead, this is the Tunguska incident, uh, which was an impactor of some kind that before it reached the ground, it actually exploded in air because of the heating up that was happening as it was going through Earth's atmosphere. But that explosion still flattened trees in all directions in a circular kind of pattern, uh, and it took quite a while for anyone to get out to that remote site and, um, and kind of see what happened. One of the most famous examples uh, is the crater that 
led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. Uh, it's a common misconception that that crater, that kind of moment of impact, was when everything um, died around the globe. Uh, and that isn't the case. But one of the things that we briefly saw in that diagram of the stages of making a crater is that all of that vaporized stuff kind of gets thrown up and it falls back down. And for a crater of the size needed to, um, to take out the dinosaurs, it was actually all of that material um, that got put into the atmosphere that uh, drastically changed the temperature on Earth, and so the whole food chain got affected. Plants weren't getting enough sunlight, uh, so they started to die out. Herbivores then um, followed up. And then big carnivores that we're familiar with thinking about when we think about dinosaurs uh, didn't have enough food either. So it was a kind of drawn out process that did start with that extinction level event crater. And then uh, one of the most recent craters, uh, only 50,000 years ago, uh, is in Arizona. It's called Behringer Crater or Meteor Crater. Uh, and for a long time when it was first discovered, people thought it was just a kind of volcanic um, activity crater. Uh, they can look similar. But it was verified that this was from an impactor uh, about 50,000 years ago. Uh, and there was a lot of mining operations to try to find pieces of it, but it had vaporized too when it landed. This crater here on Earth, even though I said that we have this whole recycling process, because it is so new and it uh, kind of hit in the middle of nowhere uh, in the desert, it is remarkably well preserved and it's actually the best single large crater um, in the whole solar system. Because if we think back to the, the picture we had of the moon, there's all of this overlap of all of these different cratering uh, incidents. And so uh, this one is the, the most well preserved crater in the solar system, which is kind of cool. Now, when we think about the things that cause craters, uh, we are often thinking about this leftover material from way back when the solar system formed. So the rest of this video, we're going to talk briefly about what that leftover material looks like, and then finish up by making sure we understand the formation of the solar system as a process. So this cosmic debris, this leftover material, is what we use to study uh, what the solar system materials looked like so that we can kind of work backwards in time. That material is typically put into two different categories. Rocky material, which is typically asteroids, uh, when we're talking about these really big objects, and we talked already about the asteroid belt in between the inner planets and the outer planets. But also when we think about meteorites, if we've ever seen any in science museums or um, for sale in rock shops, they are small, um, often metallic uh, objects, but they also can form out of um, rocks, just silicate materials. Uh, and we actually have different names that we do want to be able to distinguish. Meteoroids are the term for when they're in space. That word isn't used that often because normally a small enough thing that's going to become a meteorite on the ground um, isn't, isn't able to be observed while it's just kind of floating in space, not interacting with the Earth. Meteors for when it's streaking through our atmosphere. If you've ever seen a meteor shower or even a single shooting star, that is a meteor. And then the object that hits the ground and that we could pick up and put into a museum um, or a collection is a meteorite. So that implies that it has already interacted with the Earth and has made it to the ground. And then icy material, when we introduce the terms for these outer regions, Kuiper Belt and Oort Cloud, those are where we typically find icy objects. That's where some of the dwarf planets are, but that is also where we find the cosmic debris category of comets. So let's talk about comets first. So um, comets are some of the oldest recorded written observations we have from astronomy because when they showed up in the sky, uh, they are typically really interesting looking uh, and often were considered to be a kind of bad omen because of just how mysterious and different they appeared to be. Over the course of several weeks, as a comet gets uh, closer to the inner solar system and starts to sublimate, that's the fancy word of saying goes from a solid to a gas, because in space you can't really melt without uh, high enough pressure, so you sublimate instead. 
You form these two different tails as a comet. Uh, one is all of the particulate matter, the dust tail, and then the gas tail refers to charged particles that are going to be um, blown back by the solar wind. That's a term that we briefly mentioned when we introduced the Earth's magnetic field. We're going to learn a lot more about it in later weeks. But that gas tail, or in the left image, it's sometimes called an ion tail to indicate that they are charged particles. They are exactly opposite the sun. So often we think of comets as those tails being kind of blown back behind them, uh, and that is not the case. A comet's tail could actually point uh, in the same direction that it's moving, uh, at least a little bit, which is counter to what we might have expected. So I actually would recommend that you briefly take a moment to pause the video and sketch that comet's orbit and the tails into your notes uh, and make this kind of clear statement to yourself that the tails point away from the sun. You can see that they also bend a little bit based on the motion of the comet, but in general, they are pointing away from the sun. So pause if you wanna take, uh, take that note down and draw that little sketch. Okay, so comets, the big thing we want to recognize uh, is what I said on the previous slide, that they're mostly ices. They do have rocky materials as well. They're sometimes referred to as dirty snowballs. Uh, and if you think about, for example, at the end of a long winter in Michigan, that um, kind of blackened snow on the side of the road after all of the car exhaust has gone by, that is actually a kind of reasonable thought uh, for what comets look like. They aren't shiny. They aren't like pristine ice, like water ices. They have all of this extra stuff, like the car exhaust, that makes them not that shiny, um, but rather a mix of a whole bunch of different leftover stuff. Now, we talked about the asteroid belt uh, as much as we needed to uh, in a prior video, so let's focus on that last thing I mentioned out of the list of cosmic debris, which is this kind of list of terms, meteoroid, meteor, and meteorite. So again, these three related terms, I do want to make sure that we can distinguish from each other. So meteoroids are still in space. They haven't interacted with the Earth yet. And the thing that is creating meteoroids tends to be... Um, bits from the tails of comets, so we'll talk about uh, meteor showers in just a second, and those are replenished by uh, comets. Or if two asteroids do happen to have a collision in the asteroid belt, there will be bits and pieces that are thrown off in that collision, and they can then have a uh, new course, a new orbit, that takes them close enough to Earth to be kind of pulled in by our gravity. Now, once an object starts to interact with Earth's atmosphere, it will burn up, it will start to um, glow, and we'll see a streak of light through the sky, and that is a meteor. So when we wish on a shooting star, it's wishing on a small dust grain or pebble uh, that is burning up in Earth's atmosphere, but it is reminding us of our kind of cosmic connection to the, the larger regions we exist within. And then if we were to pick up an object on the ground that came from space, the thing that is now in our hand would be a meteorite. So that term is specifically designed to describe the thing that has made it all the way to the ground. And most meteors do not produce a meteorite at the end. Most meteors are fully, um, fully gotten rid of in their path through Earth's atmosphere and don't have anything left when they reach the ground. So meteor showers happen every year at a consistent time of year, and the reason that they are so consistent is because it is the Earth passing through the particular part of the solar system that has all of this leftover kind of dusty cloud of material from an old comet that has passed by. So when we learn about meteor showers, they have names like the Leonids or the Geminids, and that is actually describing where you should be looking to see them kind of originate from. It's a matter of perspective in the same way that this far right image, those train tracks do not actually reach a single point off in the distance. They just seem like it because it's so far away. All of these meteors seem to reach the same central point as well, and again, that is because they are so far away and just coming from that general direction. But the Geminids come from Gemini, the Leonids come from Leo, the Perseids come from Perseus, and so on. Now, I encourage you, if you, uh, if you have the opportunity to plan ahead, 
to look for some of these meteor showers and make plans to watch them. Uh, I know that it gets very cloudy uh, sometimes, especially in August, but the Perseid meteor shower is bolded here because it is one of the most popular um, and one of the most plentiful meteor showers that we have. Now, if you look at this list, uh, and you don't have to write it down, you don't have to memorize it, this is information that's also in our textbook, what you'll see is that uh, most of these associated parent objects are comets, but there are two that come from asteroids where we know that there's this leftover kind of pebble material coming off of a particular asteroid's orbit. The Geminids are also bolded here because they are indeed one of the other really strong, powerful meteor showers each year. But always keep an eye on the news. Uh, astronomers track these and kind of can know ahead of time whether they're going to be stronger or weaker on a particular year. And so it's it's worth planning ahead and seeing if you can if you can catch a fun meteor shower, more than just a couple shooting stars. All right. For the meteorites themselves, uh, they come in different types, so they can be mostly stony, they can be mostly iron, uh, metallic, they can be a kind of mix of these, and they allow us to have a piece of pristine space debris uh, that has the same starting point as the rest of our solar system. And so by being able to collect and have these available for direct measurement, we actually can get a whole different type of age for the solar system, a much more accurate and reliable age for the formation of the solar system. And that is through radioactive dating. Now, we don't need to get into all of the details for this, but we do need to recognize the power of this process and how it is used. So if we have a material of some kind, an element that is unstable, it can over time on its own spontaneously turn from the parent element into the daughter element. Those are the terms that are used. And if we wait long enough, we will see less and less of the original element and more and more of the, the daughter element. And this process is statistical in the same way that if you flip a coin enough times, 50% of the time it will be heads and 50% of the time it will be tails. If we have a big enough sample size, then we can, based on the element itself, wait long enough and we will get about half of the original sample, uh, half of the parent element and half of the daughter element after a period of time called one half-life. And it's a known um, length of time for different elements. So when we get these meteorites, we can test for the small amounts of any, uh, any kind of radioactive material that they have, how much of the parent element do they have and how much of the daughter element? If they have an eighth of the parent element left, then we know that three half-lives have passed and we can estimate how long that rock has been in existence for. And astronomers have a couple of different elements that all, all have half-lives of billions of years and each one of those measurements allows us a different confirmation of the age. And they all point to the same approximate age of, of 5 billion years. So when we want to talk about the history of the solar system and the formation of the solar system, we want to collect all the different facts that we've learned so that we can create a model that fits the observations that we're seeing. So first, all eight of the major planets, the four inner planets and the four outer planets, all orbit in exactly the same flat plane. And they all have roughly circular orbits, which means that when they formed, that material was all kind of stable and steady and just at these, um, in this nice disk of, of material. When we look at the composition of different planets near the sun, they are rocky and there's not much else to work with. And far away from the sun, the outer planets, they have rocky material in their cores. They also have ices like water ice and ammonia ice. And especially for Jupiter and Saturn, they have large amounts of hydrogen and helium that the sun is um, primarily comprised of. And with our ability to do radioactive dating that we just talked about, we can identify that the solar system is at least four and a half billion years old. Which means that our model, if we, if we figure out what we expect the solar system to do and look like, 
that as long as it can uh, predict the Earth as it looks uh, four and a half billion years after formation, then we can kind of tell we might be on the right track. So the solar nebula model is our current best understanding of how our solar system formed. And there's kind of four simple steps uh, for our purposes. It is much more complicated overall, but we do want to be able to simplify it for our needs. So the word nebula we're going to see again in later chapters, and it refers to a cloud of dust and gas. So the solar nebula is just all of the dust and gas that was in space to begin with, maybe this kind of spherical-ish looking cloud that maybe had a, some initial rotation just by random chance. But something caused that cloud of gas and dust to collapse. When we talk about star formation in later weeks, we will talk about all of the different things that can trigger star formation, but we need this initial push and then gravity can take over. As gravity takes over though, the conservation of angular momentum in order to have it get smaller while not breaking physics, it also has to speed up. If you've ever watched figure skaters, when they have their arms out, they might be rotating um, a certain speed, but they bring their arms in when they want to rotate really, really fast. And that's the same property of conservation of angular momentum. And that spinning faster flattens out um, the gas and dust, the same way that if we were to spin a pizza, um, it also can flatten out as well, the pizza dough. Now, as that flattening out disk of material is um, rotating, it starts to have most of the material concentrate towards the center. That's going to be the sun. And we mentioned at the very beginning of our solar system introduction that the sun is 99.8% of all of the mass that we're talking about when we talk about the solar system. So most of it goes to the center, but the leftovers all stay in that disk and gravity is start, starting to be able to pull them into um, small pieces as well. So we create the building blocks of planets called planetesimals. We don't really need that term in our vocabulary, but what we want to recognize is as we start to make planets, they're going to be where all the material already is. And so now we need to figure out why the material is different near the sun versus far from the sun. And if you had to guess whether um, there was going to be a difference if you're near the hot object or far away from the hot object, you'd be right. Uh, at some point, although we don't need these fancy terms, at some point when we're near the sun, a whole bunch of stuff is too hot to be solid. Water is too hot to be solid. It's in steam form. It's the water molecules are there, but they are not available um, as building blocks. They're just moving around too fast and they're not solids. But the metals um, are solid even at fairly high temperatures because we're still not in the sun, we're away from it. So if you look at this, at this map here, uh, it's showing the location of planets without trying to indicate their correct sizes. But it's also indicating where things are first become solid. So metal oxides and iron nickel alloy, they are already solid at the orbit of Mercury, and that's the majority of what Mercury is made out of. Mercury has a huge metal core um, and very little rock on top of it. Then silicate materials start to condense out and become solid, um, and it takes quite a while. If we look at where this happens, um, the water, ammonia, and methane are all way out in the outer solar system. And there's a key point called the ice line where if we are far enough away from the sun, it is cold enough to have ices. And if we look at where that ice line is approximately, we see that the inner solar systems uh, the inner solar system planets uh, are closer to the sun, so they only have the metal and rock available in solid form. And then the outer planets are all past the ice line where they have more building blocks. They have more Legos to play with and they get larger. So we get Uranus and Neptune to be four times the size of Earth. Jupiter and Saturn also have about that same amount of rocks plus metals plus ices. And then Jupiter and Saturn were able to um, collect that so quickly that they grew big enough to have the kind of gravity that can then pull in some of the hydrogen and helium gas. That hydrogen and helium gas needs strong gravity to be kind of held together. 
Um, and so only Jupiter and Saturn really had the time to be able to collect it before we um, kind of dissipated the disk that all this stuff is forming out of. So in the end, this is the last slide for the module. In the end, when we think about how our solar system looks, the inner planets and the outer planets, they both had rock to work with. But the inner planets were in a region that was far too hot in order to have the solid ices, water ice, methane ice, ammonia ice, that the outer planets could build from. And it is worth recognizing in this summary slide that the dwarf planets do not fit this kind of standard model because they have crooked orbits. They didn't form at the same time or in the same process that our eight major planets did, but they still have rocks and metals. They're still part of this same solar nebula. And most of the dwarf planets, not Ceres in the asteroid belt, but most of the dwarf planets are also in this outer region where ices were left over as well. But they did not have time to get big to be able to collect hydrogen and helium gases as well. So they stayed small with just the leftover um, solids that were in the outer solar system. So this finishes up all of module two. We talked about uh, moon phases and eclipses and then our overall view of the solar system. As we continue on to future modules, we're going to be broadening our view beyond our solar system. So we kind of start small and work our way outward. I look forward to the journey with you. Thanks for watching.